Welcome Rotarians and guests to our Monday Downtown Rotary virtual meeting. Uh, this week, our president-elect Jason Herbolt is gonna moderate this conversation and we will not take questions from Rotarians today as Jason has prepared, prepared the forum and the questions. Today, our guests are uh, the candidates running for the Northwest District seat in the Sioux Falls City Council. Uh, they are going to face off uh, in this conversation today. Um, we have incumbent Greg Neitzer and challenger Julian Bodwine. Uh, they are, again, as I said, are vying for a seat in the Northwest District. Uh, in keeping with Rotary values, uh, here are the tenants of the Rotary four-way test. Um, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And it will and will it be beneficial to all concerned? Uh, we welcome you all to join us today. We're glad to have you with us. Um, we are looking forward to an informative and productive conversation. And I will turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, President Jesse. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this forum and debate featuring the two candidates running to represent the Northwest District on the Sioux Falls City Council. They are Greg Neitzert, the incumbent, and Julian Bodwan, the challenger. My name is Jason Harrible, president-elect of Downtown Rotary, and it is my true honor to serve as today's moderator. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Down Downtown Sioux Falls, thank you for your interest in the up upcoming municipal election and in this community's future. We are grateful to Greg Neitzert and Julian Bodwan for their participation in this forum. And, and even more important, we thank them for seeking public service and public office and for their desire to serve in the best interests of our city. The Sioux Falls municipal election will be held in three weeks on Tuesday, June 2nd. The race between Greg Neitzert and Julian Bodwan will be decided by registered votes, voters living within the boundaries of the Northwest District. Election officials are offering a safe option for voters to maintain social distancing. Absentee ballots are available now by contacting the Minnehaha County Auditor's Office. And voting can be done by completely by mail. As the moderator, I am solely responsible for the questions which I have not shared to either of these candidates in advance. I will pose identical questions to both, to both of the candidates. At my discretion, and to be fair, occasionally I may accommodate brief rebuttals. We will allow up to two minutes for each response. Our timekeeper, Rotary Club President Jesse Schmidt, will hold up cards to warn the candidates as time winds down and expires. We will get to as many of the questions as time allows. This program will run for about one hour. The initial order will be Greg Neitzer and then Julian Bodmar. But, and what we'll do is we'll just alternate who takes the lead on the questions one by one. Greg, Julian, are you okay with these with this cat with this approach to the debate? Yes, I am. Yes. Thank you. Introduction, the first topic. Greg, you'll go first. Before we dive into a discussion of your candidacies and the issues at hand, let's just begin with introductions. Tell us about your upbringing and background, your family, your education, your work experience, your community involvement, and your passions. Greg. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Neitzer. I have had the honor of serving as a Northwest District City Councilor for the last four years. I grew up in Sioux Falls in a working class neighborhood on the east side. We lived in a modest house. Money was tight. I'm the son of an auto mechanic and a nurse, and from them I learned the values of hard work and living on a budget. I've taken that work ethic and that conservative mindset to the city council. I have a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, and I've been employed with the same company for 19 years as a software engineer. 
You know, we face unprecedented challenges and many opportunities. The problem solving skills I, I've honed in my job as a software engineer give me the unique ability to break down complex problems and help define solutions. I've lived in Sioux Falls for 25 years. I've been married to my wife, Jennifer, for 18 years. We have one daughter, Olivia, who is 11 years old and will be entering Memorial Middle School next year. I served on the Zoning Board of Adjustment for five years from 2011 to 2016. I served on the Billboard Task Force in 2015. In 2016, I was honored to be elected to the Sioux Falls City Council representing the Northwest District. During those four years, I've served on the Annexation Task Force. I've chaired the City Council Audit Committee for two years, and I'm currently the Vice Chair of the City Council. If reelected, I'll continue to tirelessly serve my constituents and focus on four main priorities, roads, financial strength, public safety, and quality of life. I believe I deserve a second term. I do my due diligence. I stand on principle and I'm a proven leader. I'm asking for your vote on June 2nd to continue serving as your Northwest District City Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Julian. Well, first off, thank you guys for uh, inviting me and having me and giving me the platform and the opportunity to speak today uh, to an audience that uh, I, I might not have uh, been in front of otherwise. Uh, my name is Julian Baldwin. Uh, once again, I'm running for city council in the Northwest District here in Sioux Falls. Uh, I am a law enforcement officer and I've been in law enforcement uh, for approximately 10 years now. My wife and I own a restaurant downtown, Swamp Daddy's Cajun Kitchen. We are small business owners and entrepreneurs in our community as well. Uh, we started our journey off uh, with a, a, a cart uh, in front of uh, different downtown businesses down uh, late night, um, serving jambalaya off that cart. My mom actually did. We moved from that cart into uh, a, a place of worship, uh, our, our church building, who actually allowed us to use the facilities to run a restaurant several days out of the week. Uh, we built up uh, enough revenue from that to own a food truck, and now we own a restaurant downtown um, and are proud to say uh, that we did so uh, through whatever struggles may have come without um, a, a business loan, but we also did so with a ton of help from the business community in Sioux Falls. Uh, I am also uh, the current uh, uh, Vice President of Establishing Sustainable Connections in Sioux Falls. And so with Establishing Sustainable Connections, we work really, really hard and diligently to provide sustainable relationships throughout our entire community to ensure that everyone has the opportunity for success in Sioux Falls. I am also the co-director, or excuse me, the uh, vice director of our South Dakota African American History Museum here in South Dakota. Uh, I have worked very, very hard to maintain relationships, to build relationships, uh, and to build the trust of our community um, so that many of our not, not just many, but all of our uh, constituents in Sioux Falls may succeed. Thank you, Greg. The next question will go to you, Julian, first. And the topic is the role of a city councilor. What are the roles and responsibilities of a city councilor as opposed to other offices? What has prepared you to serve on the council and what motivates you to run? So first and foremost, the, the role of, of a city council or really any government official, in, in my opinion, is to ensure that the quality of life for the citizens of that community are as best as we can possibly get them. Um, and so while things are, are good in Sioux Falls, there's always going to be an opportunity to grow, always going to be an opportunity to get better um, in, in every situation. And so what prepared me for this was my role in public service. As I mentioned before, I've served as a law enforcement officer for the state of South Dakota for approximately 10 years now. That has prepared me uh, ethically, morally, and has also prepared me to serve with, high, uh, with a high level of integrity uh, for our community, for our state, and I hold those values really, really dear to my heart. Uh, my mom is actually a retired nurse. My father is, uh, is a, uh, was, I'm sorry, he passed away, but my father was uh, a retired educator. And so my family, all we know is service. Um, and so from, from the womb, really, from the time that I was born, from the time that I took my first step, um, it was really ingrained in me that service to the people is invaluable. Um, and so everything that I've done up until this point, uh, all of my experience, all of my work experience, all of the knowledge that I've gained, it has prepared me 
to lead uh, in the in the proper way here in Sioux Falls. Thank you, Julian. Greg. Well, first and foremost, really, it's about being a advocate for the citizens and really being a liaison. You know, one of the things that I've learned in the last four years is one of our most important roles is something that you don't see on TV, you don't see in meetings. We get calls all the time, we get emails, and it's really somebody who's, they have a problem and they're looking for, how do I solve it? Maybe they don't know who to reach out to. They have a pothole on their street, they don't know who to, who to reach out to. They have maybe uh, a neighbor who's, who's uh, doing something that, that may be against code, they don't know who to reach out to. And, and we're just the liaison where we can reach out, we know who to contact and we can get the job done and get them connected to the right resources. Many times it's uh, advocacy, for example, uh, standing up for somebody who maybe they don't have the resources to do it themselves. Uh, for example, somebody whose water stopped working at a mobile home park uh, because the mobile home park owner wasn't maintaining the water system. And I had to step in and talk to the owners and say, you need to fix this and bring the right resources to bear to get that problem solved. So it's really about citizen advocacy. Um, you gotta think about what is best for the city 20, 30, 40 years from now, not two weeks from now, and, and not what is in your self-interest, but what is in the best interest of the city and all citizens long-term. Sometimes you have uh, very powerful, very strong voices, but they may represent the minority, but you got to think about the entire city long-term. Really why I wanted to serve was really about giving back. The city has really given me so much. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. And really it just goes back to when it comes to the city, uh, in, in city government, it's, it's something that, it's very basic. Roads, uh, public infrastructure, and quality of life, making an amazing place for people to live that they can afford, that's really what it's all about, and that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you, Greg. The next topic is representing the Northwest District. Greg, you'll be, um, the question will be directed to you first here. The eight-member council consists of three members elected at large and five representing geographic districts. As the counselor from the Northwest District, how do you balance the interests and concerns of the Northwestern neighborhoods with the welfare of the city overall? Well, that's a good question. And something you learn on the city council is that although we are district representatives and we advocate for the district, we represent everybody. I get calls from people from around the city and I don't look up to see where they, what district they reside in. It's irrelevant. If you're a citizen of Sioux Falls and you have a problem, I'm gonna help you take care of it. And I've done that. The Northwest District, as I've, I've walked it twice now, you find out that it's, it's an amazing district because of really a, the diversity. And depending on where you go, they have different, different problems and different things that are more important to them. You may have closer to the core, you might have more issues with crime and concern about some of those things. And then you go to other areas and maybe it's quality of life. Uh, so it's, it's really a diverse set of problems. And when you're making decisions, it's about advocating for those citizens one-on-one -on -one that are in your district, but also not losing sight that we are one Sioux Falls. We're not completely parochial. So you have to be thinking about the entire city. And many times uh, without fail, the right answer for your district is also the right answer for the city. This isn't about competing. We all have equal votes. It doesn't matter whether you're at large or you're a district member. So we're all trying to do what's best for the city. So I think that's something that's, that's really, really great. It's not something where we're fighting about where a pool should go or anything like anything in that sense. It's really about what is best for the city, what makes sense for all citizens, because obviously we all travel around the city and we all want what's best for the city. So really it's, it, being that district representative is the person that people know that they can call and you have a unique knowledge of the district because you live it, you breathe it, you're there all the time. So they're the person that, that people will reach out to, but it's really about doing what's best for the city and they're one and the same. They don't have to be in conflict. Thank you, Greg. Julian. So as far as the interest goes of our community of the Northwest District, um, you know, I've also had the opportunity to, to walk our, our district and our neighborhoods here within the district. Uh, and really one of the things that really jump out to me is a lot of people are talking about the amount of parks that we have in our district. Um, we have the least amount of parks in the Northwest District from any other district around the city. Um, and while the bike trails have been a great addition uh, 
to, to the district, to the Northwest District, uh, one of the things that really uh, people hold near and dear to their heart are more green spaces. Um, and so when we talk about green spaces, we also talk about public safety and what that means for public safety. Um, and so me being in the public safety uh, uh, realm for almost 10 years, um, I have the expertise, I have the experience, I have the knowledge to know what it takes to ensure that when we add green spaces, when we develop these things towards our, uh, our, our uh, bike, uh, bike paths um, and our walking paths, I have the experience to ensure that we keep our neighborhood safe. Um, the other thing that I, that I did wanna mention as well is speeding in neighborhoods. You know, it, we talk about we talk about a lot of things as far as as far as water, as far as utilities, as far as roads. Yes, those things are absolutely great, um, and those things are absolutely necessary when you, you talk about the city council. But the people in our district care about things such as green spaces. They care about the safety of their children. Um, they care about the speeders in their neighborhood. And what can we do to actually stop that? Um, there there have been many many complaints uh, within our district um, that have not gone answered. Um, even when you talk about uh, something as simple as a fire hydrant um, that, that had the arm raised on it so the snowplow can actually get to it, uh, so the snowplows can actually uh, see, see the roadway. Well, those things went unanswered. Um, and so that's what I'm hearing from the constituents in the neighborhood. Those are the things that we need to focus on first. Um, we need to focus on public safety, public health, and then we can Thank also... You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Julian, you're up again. Uh, the next topic, uh, COVID-19 public health response, big subject. Sioux Falls, where Smithfield Foods was for a, single, for a point in time, the single biggest COVID-19 hotspot in the country, is grappling with the greatest public health crisis in at least a century. As a community, what have we done right and where have we fallen short in our response? Julian. So as a community, I think one of the things that really come to mind when we talk about doing something right is our unity. Um, we have shown a very, very strong display of unity uh, within this community. And we know anytime that we're hit with something that's difficult, whether it be uh, COVID-19 or whether it be the tornadoes, our community has an opportunity to come together. And we do that, in my opinion, better than anybody in this country. Um, one of the things that I, that I strongly believe in, though, that we had a, 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 an area of opportunity to grow, if you will, um, is, is in our representation. Um, you know, my opponent talked about diversity in his previous answer, and I want to touch on that when I answer this as well. It takes someone with the knowledge of having uh, a diverse background, uh, whether it be in law enforcement, whether it be uh, uh, in racial inequities, whether it be in health inequities, uh, whether it be knowing the economy. Um, we need someone who has the knowledge, who has the expertise and the experience in those areas, and that person is me. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we did not do in particular for Smithfield um, is that we ignored the fact that people of color actually have more uh, health disparities that make them more susceptible to not only catching this, this uh, horrible disease, but also dying of this disease. And so not properly testing them, not properly stepping in to Smithfield and working with human resources or working with upper management and human resources to ensure that the people remained safe at, at Smithfield and remained alive. I think that was one of the biggest things uh, that, that we could. Thank you, Julian. Greg. Yeah, I'll be happy to answer the uh, COVID question, but I just want to circle back if it's okay and just respond to something regarding uh, the, the parks. I've heard this stated multiple times that we have the least amount of parks and it, it, it's just not true. We actually have the most park acres in the entire city, not including Family Park. We have the second most parks. We're tied with the uh, Central District for the, for the second most number of parks. We have well more than the Southeast and the Southwest a number of parks. We're buying parkland in advance. And then in terms of speeding, uh, that's something that's a, a big passion of mine and we, we are aggressively working on that. And that really comes down to traffic calming and working with PD on that. Going to COVID, uh, you know, one of the things I think that we really did right was standing up our emergency operations center. We do that with every, any sort of emergency or disaster and that's bringing multi-agencies together, bringing the hospitals together, 
um, I was able to be in there and, and see what was going on. And, and we really, really work well together. The other thing is focusing on the goal. And we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of the goal, which is making sure that there are enough hospital beds, that there is a hospital bed for you when you need it. And as leaders, we also need to be very clear with people. There is no vaccine. There are people that are going to get sick, infections are going to rise, and unfortunately, people are going to die. It's tragic, it's horrible, and we have to do everything we can to protect vulnerable populations, but it is going to increase, and we have to make sure that we are telling people that and telling people, let's take precautions, let's do everything we can to protect uh, the nursing homes and the hospitals and, the, and, those, and the elderly, whatever we can do but some people are going to get sick and we have to make sure that we take prudent precautions, but we don't live in fear. And we have to make sure that we can continue to move forward. And we have to think about the costs that are also being borne on people because of the response. And we, and we have to be proportional in our response. People are hurting badly right now and having also physical problems because of the response. So we have to have balance and that's really, really important. Julie, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a rebuttal on the parks question as it pertains to your district. Sure, I, I think it's very important to understand the terminology that was used. Uh, while we might have more park acres than anyone else in the district, we do have less, uh, the least amount of green spaces uh, when you talk about numbers in particular. Um, and so when we also talk about parks and developing those parks into what's currently there, such as the bike paths, as I mentioned earlier, um, we really need to talk about how we protect the people who are using those spaces. Um, and so that's the expertise that I bring to the table. Thank you, Julian. The next question is on leadership. Greg, specifically, which of our current leaders here in Sioux Falls or elsewhere are role models for you? And what gives you confidence that you have the right qualities, the relevant experience, and the good judgment to help lead our city through this unprecedented humanitarian and economic crisis? Sure. Well, well there's a, a number of people I look up to, and I'm actually going to call out two people that are very active right now, and for two different reasons, uh, interestingly. The first I'm going to say is Governor Nome. Now, you may or may not agree with her response and whether or not she's doing the right things, but she has been steady and principled. She's been very, very clear. These are my principles and I'm sticking to them. And I think that's really, really important in a leader. And so I think she's been very impressive through this. Again, you may, you may quibble on the decisions or maybe the direction, but I think the consistency has been really, really impressive. She's been very solid. And then I'm going to actually pivot and I'm going to go to Mayor Paul Tenhaken. He was advocating for a stay at home order. Now, one thing that leaders sometimes do is they don't want to admit that they were wrong and they dig in even when the data in front of them is saying something different. He didn't do that. He said, I was wrong. And he said that in an interview. And a lot of times leaders don't do that. He said, I was wrong. And he pivoted and he said, we need to go in another direction. That would be something very difficult to do for very many people. That, that's a, that can be a tough thing to do. But he said, I was wrong. The right thing to do is to go in this completely different direction, which got him a lot of criticism. So I really, really admire that. It takes a humble leader and a good servant to do that. I think I've demonstrated through this crisis and over the last four years that I am a good leader. I do my due diligence. I make decisions based on the facts. I don't panic. I don't give in to the loudest voices. And I think long and hard and I stand on principle and I do stand on principle. And I've done that through this crisis and tried to project confidence and calm and not being afraid. And that's really, really important. We have to project confidence during this and help to lift people up. Thank you, Greg. The question to you, Julian. So I'm gonna actually take a step outside of politics uh, to talk about those who I look up to. Um, and I wrote a few names down, hopefully I can get them all in. Three, three people in particular come to mind. Uh, my grandmother, 
my aunt who uh, actually just turned 93 years old, uh, great aunt, um, and then also Master Sergeant Roger Jackson. So I grew up uh, in Alexandria, Louisiana, which is a very, very poor neighborhood, especially when you talk about four minorities. Uh, my father passed away. He was deceased when I was in the 10th grade. And Master Sergeant Roger Jackson uh, really stepped in and became um, a role model, the absolute best role model that I needed in my life at that time as an educator, as someone who was in the military, as someone who carried himself with so much class and so much dignity. Um, he really set the example of what I needed to be as a man. Um, not having that example, um, you know, growing up sometimes can be detrimental to kids. And so I really, really appreciate the role of educators all around who are serving as role models for anyone. Um, the other thing is, is, as I said, my grandmother and my aunt. Um, and so I was raised by, I was raised by mostly women, my mom, my sister, my aunts, my grandmother. When you're in, in situations of, uh, of poverty, sometimes family and friends have to step in to help raise an individual. And that's exactly what happened uh, in, in my life. So those two ladies in particular, uh, older ladies of the older generation, they stepped in and really teach me uh, how, to, how to treat individuals, how to carry myself, um, how to treat people with, with a high level of integrity, um, how to carry myself with, with the high level of morals and ethics, um, and really how to make the proper decisions. One of the things, real quick, one of the things that my grandmother uh, and Master Sergeant Roger Jackson would always say is that it's unsat. And that means that my decision was unsatisfactory, not just to myself, but to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I have to make sure I'm making the proper decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> this next question is to you, Julian. And it's around the subject of city revenue. Sioux Falls, like local governments everywhere, faces the inevitable prospect of plummeting tax revenue. What will be your priorities and guiding principles as you work with the mayor, your council colleagues and the people of Sioux Falls to maintain vital city services, ensure the health and safety of all our residents, preserve our quality of life, and still balance the city budget. Julian. So we all know that our city government and our revenue and our economy has taken a big hit because of COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that my wife and I have implemented from day one uh, of, of having a small business is to ensure that people come first. See, what we understand is that our business would not be sustainable without the people in our community. Um, and so we ensure to put the people first, we ensure that our employees are safe, that our employees have the best working conditions so that when we do provide a service uh, to, to our people that would benefit our economy, uh, that that service would actually benefit in a major way. I'm a big proponent of small business ownership and I believe that small business owners in particular care about people over they care uh, more than they care about profit. Now, do we, do we need our businesses to open up as soon as we possibly can? Absolutely. Uh, but working with the people of this community first to ensure that we're doing it the right way, that we're doing it in a way that's sustainable for our economy, that we're also doing it a way that's sustainable for our leadership to grow within that realm, I believe is the most important thing that we can do. Thank you, Julian. Question to you, Greg. Uh, you know, we are better posi positioned than any city in the country to ride this out. And that is because of decades of planning and prudent decisions. We keep a reserve fund. That fund is 25% is minimum of our annual operating budget. Our annual operating budget is about $178 million. So one quarter of that is about $44 million. We currently have about $56 million in that reserve. We could literally have no revenue for three, four, five months, and we would be fine. The reason we do that, and many times people say, why do you have so much cash in the bank? It's for days like this. It's our emergency fund. So we are going to be okay. We don't have to panic. We're not going to have to raise fees or taxes. We don't have to cut vital services. We can simply make adjustments. And when you split, split our budget, really the best way to look at it is you have the operating fund, which is the day-to-day -day services, which is funded by that reserve fund. So, so we'll be okay in that regard. In our capital fund, our second penny, 
It's simply a matter of we can just cut a few projects. We just delay a few projects to a next year and we'll be okay. We had a strong 2019. We had a strong first three months of 2020. So we already have excess revenues from that. Our entertainment tax, our entertainment facilities are idle. We can literally uh, make cuts there with just literally they're not running. Um, and so we can cut projects like, for example, if we're going to do a remodel in the, in the uh, convention center, we just delay that a year. Our enterprises are very strong. They're self-sufficient. And they really have seen very little hits to their revenue. The only one is parking. And uh, actually, our lease revenue really hasn't moved. Very few people are canceling their leases, and that's where most of the revenue is. So simply just uh, making a few adjustments, we've been fine. So across the board, we're going to be okay. Does it hurt? Yes. But we can, be, we can adjust. We're going to be fine. We don't have to panic. We have planned for this. It's time to execute to the plan. Thank you, Greg. The next question talks about uh, really governance, the council and the mayor. Greg, what's your assessment of how well the city council and the mayor are functioning together? And how would you contribute to the democratic process, thoughtful decision-making and good governance? Sure, I, I would say uh, we're doing very well. This mayor is really a, a man of character. And one of the great qualities that this mayor has is he can disagree without being disagreeable and he doesn't take things personally. Those are so important when you are serving in a governmental capacity and then you're working with units of government and when you're working between the two branches of government. It's being able to disagree without being disagreeable and know that we're all looking out for the citizens, we all have the same goal. Sometimes we are going to differ on policy and that's okay. We can shake hands when we're done. Maybe we don't shake hands right now, but we know that we're all trying to do the right thing. And so we've been very, very constructive. And so we can disagree and it's just not an issue. Um, it, it, it's something where we all have to just be able to say to each other, I know you're a good person. We just disagree and that's okay. And that's something that I talk to, to my daughter a lot about. This is a great learning experience for her as well, to see that it's okay to disagree on policy and it's okay to disagree on things. And you can separate the fact that you disagree on an item, but that doesn't mean that that person is a bad person. So it's about recognizing that, recognizing that we all have the same goal and working towards that goal. And sometimes, sometimes we're just not going to agree. Sometimes you can find compromise. Um, and, and, and many times you can. Sometimes you just can't get there and that's okay. But it's about listening and coming up with solutions. And we've done that many, many times. And I'm really proud of the work we've done. Thank you, Greg. The question is to you, Julian. Thank you. Um, what, one of the things that I've really started to see in the change of administrations between our previous mayor and this current mayor is the ability to develop relationships. And I talked about this before as well in the experience that I have developing and sustaining relationships. Um, as a law enforcement officer, one of the things that I, that I stress to those that I teach in class is that you can't properly understand the community, uh, excuse me, you can't uh, properly and effectively police the community until you properly and understand or uh, effectively uh, understand the community that you are policing. And so I will say the exact same thing when it comes to when it comes to city government. We might have disagreements, but I think a lot of those policy disagreements come because we don't understand the community that we are creating the policy for. Um, and so that's why I believe it is extremely important to have representation. When you talk about representation in law enforcement, uh, serving in a leadership capacity, or you talk about a person of color uh, in, a, in a leadership capacity uh, serving in that role. I have the ability to understand two, two sides of that, corn, co uh, of, the, of that coin that no one on our current council has. I bring that experience, I bring that expertise, and I believe just understanding that can actually help us to put, put aside our disagreements and come forth with policies that work for everyone. Um, a lot of the times we talk about uh, we, we talk about putting some people to the side because of the majority. And I heard that today, you know, that maybe loud voices or the minority uh, can be loud in some cases, well, the minority is loud in some cases because we don't talk to them, we don't understand them uh, properly, and we don't effectively communicate with them properly. 
I have worked over the over the past eight or nine years to make sure that I am developing those relationships, sustaining those relationships, and understanding the needs of the people in our community. Thank you, Julian. Greg, I'm going to give you a chance to for a rebuttal on the question of understanding. Sure, absolutely. Uh, do a lot of listening. We all do a lot of listening. Whenever we're making decisions, one of the first things I want to do is I want to talk to the stakeholders. If we're making a decision about garbage collection. I don't think I know better than garbage companies. We get them in the room and we sit down and we talk to them. We're making decisions about mobile home parks. We talk to them. We have a decision that we have to make about gender identity. I'm talking to people who are transgendered. And so we communicate, we listen. Thank you. The next question is to you, Julian, and the first, and the subject is uh, youth at risk. What is the city's responsibility and what are your ideas for protecting and enhancing the lives of at-risk youth in the city of Sioux Falls? Julian. Well, this, uh, this particular question, you know, once again, we didn't know that this question was coming up, but I'm glad it did because this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, coming from a place of at-risk youth, as I did. Um, one of the things in particular that I believe that we can do is really create partnerships with those who are creating leadership opportunities for our youth, whether it be within uh, the public safety realm, the public health, uh, health uh, realm, or even uh, in our small, small businesses that we have around uh, our community. I truly believe that the leadership and the strength is within the people, and it starts with the youth. Uh, so one of the things that we could do is we can actually have some type of internship for our youth. Um, I've worked with a couple of, uh, and I won't mention them by name, but I've, I've worked with a couple of nonprofit organizations here in town to develop uh, some, some actual uh, mentorship programs. Uh, mentorship is extremely, extremely important when you talk about having someone to serve as a role model or having someone to serve as an example for an at-risk youth. Um, see, when we talk about youth, who have the choice to go either way, they need to know, number one, that they actually have a choice. Uh, they need to be able to see that person. And, and most of the time we talk about at, at average youth and they are children of color, but they need to be able to see someone who reflects them, whether it's in education or law enforcement or small business ownership, they need to know that it actually is a possibility and not just a discussion. Action to those words. Thank you, Julian. Question is to you, Greg. Yeah, that's something where I, I think the city's role is where we can reach out and we can work with the groups that are best connected to deal with that. And so you have groups like the Multicultural Center, which can reach out and they can make those connections with other, uh, other populations that maybe uh, we can't do as well. And they have the expertise. It's having the school resource officers and having community policing where they're in the schools and they're in their communities and they're building relationships and building trust. It's working with LSS who can work with our refugee population. It's working with the school districts. I mean, they're the ones that see them every day. That's why we have those SROs in there so that we can be working with those students. And, and it is working on internships and we are doing that. And the mentoring, that's something where our, our mayor brought that forward and, and, and um, created the partnership with Rotary. And to, to, their, to their immense credit, Rotary, that's, that's their big thing is, is they're pushing uh, mentorship. And so we have this new initiative. So. It's, it's really reaching out and making those connections early. And then of course, the things such as prevention, we're doing things to fund prevention when it comes to drugs and alcohol, all of those things where we can try to catch them early and get them on the right track. And then also helping to create funding and opportunities for education so that they know that they have somewhere, uh, somewhere to rise to so that we can get them into apprenticeships or the community college programs and, and, and have those things where they know that they can get a better life. So that's what we can do. Thank you, Greg. Greg, the next question is to, to you. It's on technology access. Question, should city government have a role and responsibility to achieve universal internet and technology access in Sioux Falls for the benefit of those who are living in poverty or who, or who are otherwise marginalized? Yes, I, I think it is somewhere where we have a role and that's gonna be a multi-agency uh, multi uh, uh, response really, because we have uh, federal work that we can do on that. We have grant programs, we have the 5G rollout, we have the school district. And, and obviously our administration in this city is very, very aggressive on the 5G rollout. And, and that's something we can continue to work on. 
uh, access to technology is something that you really are going to have to have if you're going to be able to compete or and be part of the uh, uh, society. And there's a lot of things we can do with free wireless uh, Wi-Fi everywhere. And so I think it's something that we can work on, but we should definitely be looking where we can find grant funding, state funding, because everybody has an interest in this. And I think that there's things out there that we can grab and we can harness and we can use uh, dollars that are already available. Thank you, Greg. The question is to you, Julian. Thank you. So, yeah, you know, access access to te technology is one thing, but access to the internet is totally different. And so, I I completely uh, respect that we need to have access to the five G towers and and uh, more technology when we talk about that. However, we tend to crowd our library spaces and not make them safe because uh, we we do have. Uh, an abundance of individuals that go down and hang out at the library, specifically just for free Wi-Fi. Um, and so if we did have uh, Wi-Fi accessibility throughout downtown, um, throughout our public uh, uh, transportation system, um, then I do think that that could benefit our community in more, more ways than one. Um, without spending too much time on that, I did want to circle back real quick, if you allow me to, on that last question, because I think it's very important, especially for a leader, to call out things when he sees them. Um, and so I just heard when we talked about at-risk youth, and I, I uh, mentioned in particular children of color uh, being more at risk, I just heard the words associated with them of drugs, alcohol, and crime. And so I just wanna point out that just because you're at risk does not mean that you will go into a life that leads into crime, uh, drug abuse, or alcohol abuse. That's the importance of mentorships, but that's also the importance of doing more than listening. It's the importance of understanding who you are actually serving. And so once again, that's the expertise that I bring to the table. And I think that just proved it. Greg, I'm gonna give you an opportunity for a rebuttal. Sure, well, I didn't hear myself make the connection between those two. Of course, some of the reasons why people are at risk is because of drugs and alcohol. Some are also at risk because of poverty. There's a whole host of solutions. So to just make one lumped uh, generalization just doesn't work. There's, there's a lot of facets to it and it's an individual thing, which is why people have to make individual connections and why we have to work on that and work with different groups that can make those individual connections where we don't necessarily have the resources to do it ourselves. Thank you, Greg. Oh, the next subject, diversity and inclusion. The question will go to you, Julian, first. How is our city handling its accelerating diversity and what is your plan for making Sioux Falls a better place for everyone, regardless of their backgrounds, their beliefs, their sexuality, and other fundamental differences? Julian. So one of the things that I'd just like to highlight right off the bat is that my partnership, uh, my personal partnership with uh, the Multicultural Center. I actually served on the board of directors for several years at the Multicultural Center. Um, once again, I'm the vice president of Establishes Sustainable Connections, which is a, uh, an organization who prides itself on developing relationships with those communities. Um, also, Sioux Falls Pride. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned those guys, but I, I have a personal connections, uh, connection with Sioux Falls Pride as well. You know, all the communities that we talk about, I have the connections to. Um, I don't, there, there's not one in particular plan that will help each of these communities, which once again comes back to what I talked about before, is understanding and developing those relationships with those individual communities. My community might have a need that's different than someone else's community. So one plan will not work in particular uh, for, for Sioux Falls as a whole. Um, we look right now um, you know, at, at national politics and there's a big, big talk about uh, the Black agenda. And so when we talk about the Black agenda, we're specifically focusing on Black people, but one thing that's missed is everyone else. And so in city politics, we know that we have an opportunity to do things the best way possible. Um, we can always be better, but we've never talked about an agenda for any specific person. We've always talked about the agenda for the city overall. And while that's definitely beneficial, we're missing a lot of people uh, in, in our community and we're missing the development aspect um, in, in the youth in our community. We talk about the, uh, the schools right now. We know that in about 10 years or so, most of our workforce will look just like me. More than 50% will look just like me. 
what are we setting them up for and who are we putting in, uh, in front of them in leadership positions so that they know that they can achieve the impossible. Thank you, Julian. The question now is to you, Greg, diversity and inclusion. Sure, I, once again, I think it comes back to partnerships and also our, our support of those organizations that do a really, really good job of that. It's our support and our partnership and our funding of LSS and my strong support and this council's strong support of the refugee program. The refugee program is so, so important. And unfortunately it gets lumped in with illegal immigration for some reason and, and, and all of these just terrible topics and it's just not fair. And so we continue to fight that and we stand up for them and we say that refugees are important and we will continue to support them and I will continue to support them. It's supporting the Multicultural Center. That's another organization that does a really, really good job and they're able to do some things that, that maybe we can't do so well. And so going and using their subject matter expertise and their ability to, to reach out to all of the different groups, that's really, really important. We're working really hard as a city to try to get more balance and to get more representation in our hiring. So we're trying really hard and we're doing what we can to reach out, particularly when it comes to police and fire, to reach out to those communities and figure out how can we how can we get them interested and get them to uh, apply, and how can we get get more more representation so that there's more people that may be able to make those connections uh, it, it, to those communities uh, in, in a better way. That's something that I know our police chief and our police department are working really hard at, and then in, entirely as a city, we're trying to do that as well, so that no matter who you are or what your background is, you have the same access to opportunities. And I know this city is a great city. We are good people. And I really, really believe that we all want what's best for everybody, regardless of your background, color, nationality, sexual orientation, gender identity, or anything else. Thank you, Greg. The next question is to Greg. Assess the relationship trust or mistrust, the perceptions or misperceptions between Sioux Falls and the rest of our vast state, including Governor Nome's administration and the South Dakota legislature. What, if anything, should be done about it? You know, I, I think we have a pretty good relationship. There's, there's also, uh, there's, we have competing interests sometimes, and sometimes we have to work on understanding each other's point of view, because obviously somebody in a rural community or, or on a ranch may have different interests than, uh, than Sioux Falls. And so sometimes there does seem to be uh, like there is conflict. However, I work with many of the state legislators. I know them very well. Uh, we have a working group where we sit down and we come up with legislative priorities we're talking with them, we work with them all the time. The great thing about being in South Dakota is, is that our representatives, they're just a phone call away. I can go out to coffee with, with one of them, and I do. It's something where we can communicate. It just comes down to, again, communication and, and also advocacy. And that's something where also our lobbying group is really, really good because they're in peer all the time, working with the legislator, legislators and the governor. Uh, and again, it's just making sure to, to build relationships and also to make them um, to discuss that what's best for Sioux Falls is also best for the state and vice versa. We're all in this together and also realizing we're the biggest city in the state. If we're not successful, the state will not be successful. We're generating most of the sales tax revenue. We're generating a lot of the other revenues. So as Sioux Falls, as a tie tide rises, so does the states. We rise or fall together. And that's something that we have to just continue to talk about. Julian. So yes, one, one of the things that, that I do wanna, yes, can you hear me? You can hear me? I can hear you, yes. All right, sorry, there's a lag there. Uh, one of the things I do wanna, one of the things that I do want to talk about is the fact that when I started my law enforcement career, I did so in peer. As a matter of fact, I did so working in the Capitol, uh, learning how to develop those relationships with our representatives, with our state representatives from across the entire state. And one thing that I heard more often than not was exactly what I just mentioned this previous time uh, was that 
you know, what's best for Sioux Falls might not be the best for the entirety of the state. Um, and so I tend to agree with that. Uh, Sioux Falls is its own entity. We are our own city. We have our own needs. We are the most diverse city in the state. We have the biggest economy uh, in, in the state uh, or the most vast economy, I should say, uh, in the state. And so when you talk about the needs for us, once again, as I mentioned, for, for those uh, who are diverse in needs, um, to have their own uh, platform, if you will, Sioux Falls also needs its own agenda or its own platform. Um, and so when we're talking about uh, Sioux Falls and the representatives and the mistrust between the representatives and the governors or, and this particular governor, uh, one thing that I, that, that I do see is not necessarily a sense of mistrust yet. Um, I do think it can come, but I think that there's more of a lack of communication. Um, there's a lot of one-sided uh, uh, talking um, and not necessarily listening, listening, excuse me, or wanting to understand where those representatives are coming from, or where those representatives, uh, constituents are coming from. Um, and so listening, understanding, they're two totally different things. And I think if we don't uh, focus on doing that, if we're not, uh, if we're not uh, directing ourselves or putting our attention to that, uh, then there could be a mistrust that's coming up. Thank you, Julian. We have two more questions remaining and uh, both questions you'll each be allocated two minutes like we've been doing uh, throughout the program. Um, the question is to you, Julian. Looking past the current crisis brought on by COVID-19, what is your long-term vision for what Sioux Falls should become and how will your election help the city achieve that end goal? All right, so we talk about long-term future, we talk about long-term uh, success. I think we need to start once again with our youth. Mentorship is extremely important and it's up to us as leaders now to develop those future leaders into what we want our city to really look like, what we want our city to really represent. Um, I say it all the time, Sioux Falls have, has an uh, opportunity to do things the right way. Um, people say that we're behind, but I say that we're learning. Um, you know, we look at other cities who are similar in size, similar in population, similar in demographics uh, as us. And uh, so the decisions that they make factor into the decisions that we can make. We have an opportunity to learn. We have an opportunity to get better. I believe that the strongest part of our community is the people in our community. And so when you talk about developing those people, you talk about developing the economy, you talk about uh, developing small business owners, developing future leaders, developing future employees. Um, and so mentorship is extremely important. And I want to see a mentor program grow, not just for those who are employees currently, but for our future employees and what that looks like. Thank you, Julian. Greg, to you, the question. Uh, you know, it's really an exciting time here in Sioux Falls. Uh, we're, we're, really, uh, we're really growing up and we're, we're coming to the next level as a city. And with it though, comes a lot of challenges. We, we have growing pains. When you grow this explosively, there are issues you have to deal with. We have to keep ahead of crime, which is why we have to continue to hire police officers aggressively because you're not gonna live here if you don't feel safe. We have one of the best quality of life in the nation and we need to keep it that way. And we continue to add amenities. What can we do to continue to do that? That's things like adding to our bike trail, which is why I brought forward an amendment got it passed to add a Northwest bike trail to continue from Legacy Park going north. The bike trail in our parks is one of the reasons why people live here. We want to have somewhere that people are going to want to move to, even despite our weather. And that's going to take quality of life. And it's also going to take opportunities. So what can we do in terms of workforce development? So it's going to be getting the job skills, but also getting the employers here, wanting them to relocate here. Uh, getting out of the way in some ways and letting the private sector innovate and letting them unleash their talents. They're the ones that are gonna create jobs, but creating the environment that they're gonna need, which is gonna be the quality of life, that really, really good solid infrastructure, the low cost of living, the workforce development, how we can uh, work on accessible housing and creating more housing opportunities for people, trying to, to minimize urban sprawl and to have development in the core where it makes sense because the city is going to continue to evolve and just letting people unleash their talents and reach their dreams. Thank you, Greg. The final question, and the question is to you, Greg. 
What makes you the superior candidate for the city council seat representing the Northwest District? Sure, well, first of all, I, I wanna thank you for the time today. This has really been uh, enjoyable. Uh, I think I've proven in the last four years that I, I'm a very strong leader. I do my due diligence and I take a lot of time. I listen to all sides, I listen to all the stakeholders and I make decisions based on principle and the data and the facts. It's not based on emotion, it's not reactionary. Uh, it, it's very deliberate and I'm making decisions based on the long-term best interests of the city. There's times in which I've taken votes where you know, I've made some people mad and I've said, I'm gonna make the best decision for the long-term best interests of all citizens. I'm not going to do it for uh, short-term accolades. I'm not going to do it to appease any, any small segments or, or any of those loudest voices. It's going to be in the best interest of the city. And if I take a political hit for that, that's what it is. At least I'll be able to look myself in the mirror and know that I made what I believed was the best decision. I've been steady, I've been calm, I've projected confidence, I work well with people, work well with my colleagues. I've been a leader, taken leadership roles, and I'm doing those things that I think you want from a leader. I work well with the administration, but I'm not afraid to stand on principle. I've tried to elevate the conversation, which has been really, really important. I've been very firm that we need to disagree without being disagreeable. And all of this bickering and fighting and the petty politics, is, it's gotta stop. And we are going to elevate the conversation and we are going to be better because that is what citizens want. They want us to lead with integrity. They want us to be respectful mm -hmm. and they want us to make those tough decisions. And I've found that even if somebody disagrees with me, when I explain my decisions, which I do, which is part of transparency, even if they don't agree, they respect the fact of how I got there because I explained it and they know that I gave it a lot of thought and that's all you can do. Thank you, Greg. The question to you, Julian. Yeah, thanks again for for uh, for having me here, giving me uh, the platform to speak on. Um, for for me, this is more about people and and quite a bit less about politics. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm a law enforcement officer. I'm a husband. I'm a small business owner. I'm a father. And so those things, those small things, they matter to me just like they matter to every other family in our community. And so when we talk about politics, I wanna put politics aside. What makes me the best candidate is the fact that I have uh, the experience in law enforcement. I have the experience when we talk about public safety. I have the experience when we talk about working with uh, our health partners for public health. I also have the experience when we talk about our, the diversity of our city. Once again, we are the absolute most diverse city in this entire state. And the future is extremely bright if we take care of it. And so I have the, the responsibility right now, currently, as a current leader of developing and sustaining those relationships so that our future is bright. We talk about 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. We are working now to build a platform for our future. Uh, I am also a small business owner and the economy is extremely important to me. Uh, the, the future of our economy uh, is also extremely important. One of the things that, that my wife and I are actually doing, and I'm gonna take a little bit of time uh, to, to blast my daughter here. My daughter, Jemiah, actually just put together her first business plan, or she's working to put together her first business plan. And so that, seeing, seeing the example that we are setting for her is also important to me to see the example that we're setting for other kids in our community, because seeing her do it makes me realize that the future is extremely bright for Sioux Falls. Um, so the experience that I bring to the table speaks for itself. The knowledge that I bring to the table speaks for itself. But more importantly, the work that I am currently doing in this community speaks for itself. Thank you. Julian, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our listeners uh, today, join me in personally thanking these two candidates for a very civil, thoughtful discussion today. Greg Neitzert and Julian Bodwan, thank you for coming forward to serve their district and the city of Sioux Falls as a whole. You know, at this moment in time, leadership and civil service is, is hugely important and it is critical. And we thank you two fine individuals for stepping up to do just that. To the audience, reminder, the combined city and school election is Tuesday, June 2nd, and will be conducted jointly with the primary election. 
In addition, voters have the option of voting by mail with absentee ballot. Thank you again for joining us today and please vote. Thank you.